Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life, and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. Hey, my team and I are offering a three-day intensive retreat in San Diego, California. This retreat is going to be so powerful and transformative. My team and I will show you how to discover yourself, your true potential, and help you find your path and purpose in life and uncover the warrior's courage that is within you. I literally put my heart and soul into this program. And the reason why you want this is because I will save you time and money from having to figure out all of this on your own. There are only 10 spots available for the retreat, so go to kfmretreat.com to learn more and apply for the program. Again, that's kfmretreat.com. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Dr. Andrew Hill. He received his PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA and lectures courses on gerontology and the neuroscience of healthy brain aging. He's published chapters on modulating human attention and researches self-regulation. So excited to have you here on the show, Andrew. Great. Thanks for having me, Andrew. All right, let's jump start in real quick with just a favorite success quote of yours or some sort of saying that you've lived by that's kind of relevant to work that you do. Yeah, um, you know, I was going to dig up a quote from uh, some great like Plutarch, but, but as you were uh, asking the question, uh, what occurred to me is the advice that I often give um, new undergrads that are coming to ask questions about, you know, how do I get into science? What can I do? You know, and, and they're all focused on the future. Um, with some assumptions about what they think they want to do. And those assumptions are usually wrong, right? Because they're freshmen. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, they're, 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 eight, they're 17, 18 year, year old kids, 19 year old kids occasionally. So they just don't yet know what's going on, but they're trying to look 20 years ahead and make decisions now. And so uh, I've become really harping on this idea of do what you love and success comes from the passion, from feeding that passion. Sex, success does not come from, you know, what, career might make the most money or what their parents want them to do, what grad school or what, you know, medical school or what banking or business thing that they think is going to, you know, put them in a Porsche with a, you know, with, with lots of success. I've been really harping this idea that it doesn't really matter what you do. If you love it, you will become the expert. You will put the passion and become nuanced and, you know, become the pinnacle of that thing, whatever it is. Now, is this something that you've always believed in or is this something that's kind of just developed as you've gone through well, I certainly, I certainly learned this lesson about 15 or 17 years ago, maybe more. Um, I was working in a high-tech firm. I had been doing some high-tech work for a few years. I worked in the middleware, which is databases and things, right after the tech bubble had kind of corrected, so to speak. And I had had some health and human services experience before that and probably spent you know, the, most of my, you know, from 16 years and later, working with people. Uh, working with retarded adults in residential homes, working with inpatient psychiatric uh, crisis work and stuff. Yeah, I really enjoyed that work. And the hospital that I had been working at, um, you know, my mid twenties as a case manager closed um, because uh, you know Medicare was contracting at the time. And I ended up going to work in high tech for about four or five years. And I, you know, I kind of enjoyed it for the first couple of years because I'm a geek to some extent and I like technology. But I ended up doing uh, tech evangelizing, which essentially is high-end business development, you know. And after a couple of years of that, I kind of realized that most of my effort was being spent thinking about the bottom line and not about, you know, what technology could bring us and enable us and, and everything else. So I got laid off sort of mercifully from that job. And uh, it's one of the few jobs that I've ever lost. And... Um, you know, it, it sort of forced me to reevaluate and uh, instead of just pursuing the next tech job, you know, sort of shifted gears, went back into human services, you know, went to very low pay uh, for a while and figured out what I wanted to do and then went to get a PhD, which of course is, you know, no pay <laughs> or low pay for another decade. Um, so 
you know, it, it was such a strong message I got that if you don't do what you love, you know, you don't, you aren't uh, happy. The, the success that comes is not success you want necessarily. You know, it's not success for you. It's not, not going to fulfill your needs if it's not uh, being generated by your passions. I like that uh, you said you might reach success, but it's not your success. So you might actually climb and get to the top, but you might not like where you're at because you climbed someone else's ladder. Yeah, I mean, all it takes to become a higher up or to make more money or to have more control or to become you know, better in an absolute criteria is just working hard. You know, it's making sacrifices, limiting options, deciding you know, what you're going to achieve. Achievement is doable just through you know, effort, essentially, and some strategy. But if it's not your achievement, if it's not going to you know, fulfill you, then... <laughs> To me, to some extent, it was, it's a side rail. You know, it's, it's, it's getting sort of put in a place in your life where you're not fulfilled. Um, and, you, and if you work hard to not be fulfilled, it, there's this sort of sour grapes, you know, turns to ashes a little bit in your mouth if you find yourself unfulfilled after 10 or 20 years of career building in one trajectory. Mm. And what led you down the path of pursuing a PhD in cognitive neuroscience? Well, I'd always sort of been interested in the brain, the mind. Um, I view those as the same thing. Uh, I'm sort of a reductionist. I don't believe in any non-corporeal reality. So, yeah. what what does that mean? Is there um, just I, I believe in I believe in in you know what we can experience and and, and the world is what is, uh, and that's and that's enough for me. You know, like the brain is is the most complicated machine uh, we know about you know it's more complex and has more sort of information embedded in it than galaxies potentially it's just a ridiculous machine and that is uh to me sufficient to produce the mind i don't need to go to places of a spirit or a you know um, a soul that is separate from the body i mean i'm i'm not a descartes proponent descartes was a dualist he believed that the soul and and the body or the mind and the body connected actually at the pineal gland <laughs> at, at the one place in the brain uh the descartes was a was an uh, amateur neuro uh, anatomist so he was taking apart corpses cadavers he found that everything was duplicated in the brain except for the pineal body so aha this one location must be where um, the soul attaches but i you know for me um the sheer complexity and a majesty of the brain is sufficient to explain the mind. Wow. And so, so I was at that, yeah. yeah, seeing the brain be able to do incredible things and also seeing it go awry. I mean, I'd been working in health and human services as a, as a young man, but before that, my younger brother actually got in a, a car accident. He got hit by a car when we were sledding in the winter in New England and uh, had a traumatic brain injury and ended up you know, in a coma for a little while and having some deficits for a little while. But just the sheer contrast between a happy, smiling you know, brother and a couple days later, somebody lying in a, in a, in a hospital bed and not sort of uh, understanding how profound the change in consciousness, the change in awareness and awakeness, if you will, it was, it was dramatic and it was sudden. And, you know, all of this from a little bit of swelling and some, you know, tissue damage in the brain uh, was profoundly uh, affecting my uh, shaping of my worldview. And at that point, I was already, this was like, I don't know, I think I was in seventh grade or something. So it was pretty young. And at this point, I was already somebody who, you know, if it could be taken apart, I took it apart, uh, much to the chagrin of my parents. I just had to kind of figure out how everything worked. So when presented with this puzzle of, you know, our identity, our consciousness, our minds uh, are bound, are, are, you know, supported and gendered by this, this mass of jelly, this three pound mass between our ears, and nobody really knows how it works. You know, those, those two things uh, set up sort of a cognitive dissonance, I guess, that made me start thinking about and trying to understand some of the mechanisms that, you know, support uh, the things we think of as mostly human, things like awareness and attention and sleep and consciousness. So I, I guess I started, you know, I was inspired at an early age, but um, uh, when I got laid off from that high tech job, um, it was a sign to me, I guess, that I needed to, uh, you know, choose carefully to do something that was going to be and uh, uh, feed my passions. And I went and got a job working for a psychologist who used um, something called neurofeedback or EEG biofeedback. And uh, this is with autistic spectrums and ADHD kids. And I saw profound change after profound change. 
the worst unguided missile children becoming tractable, high performing students. And, you know, occasionally nonverbal, uh, you know, self stimming autistic kids uh, calming down and making eye contact or occasionally, you know, regaining language. So I saw this incredible ability to tune the brain. And again, it was one of these circumstances where we didn't understand how it worked. I mean, we really don't understand the brain works to a you know absurd degree still uh, a couple hundred years after we've been studying it. And neurofeedback is only about, you know, 60 years old or something. And at the time I got involved with it underneath somebody who was, you know, a, 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 a really good clinician in the field, there were three or four or five different sort of schools of thought, probably three real strong schools of thought about how this stuff worked within the field being taught to clinicians. And unfortunately, they all had conflicting ideas about the mechanisms of action. And those ideas were so conflicting that if the majority of the assumptions in any of the schools were accurate, the other schools could not be you know, effective, essentially. And yet, the efficacy rates in the field, regardless of approach, were well above 80%, you know, often 90% or, or better. And so the fact that there were all these clinicians getting transformative results and nobody really had a sense of what was going on except for these disconnected uh, theories, it sort of struck me, I, I say, that we were in a blind men and elephant situation. Everyone had a piece and everyone was misinterpreting what they were, the piece of data they had wrong. And so this became a really sort of uh, a target for me to, to go back to grad school to pursue an advanced degree studying you know, the things that I was most interested in, which were brain, mind, how the brain produces our experience of being human. And by that, I mean the most human aspects of a brain, which are you know, planning, working memory, um, uh, emotion, uh, attention, things like that. Looking at uh, kind of this topic right here and uh, you know, increasing attention, and it sounds like we're kind of like trying to optimize our brain health. What are ways that we can optimize our brain health? And then also, what are signs that we currently have poor brain health? Yeah, that, that latter is a really good question. The, the, the former uh, we could go on for hours about, and I'll just hit, hit some of the high notes for you. There's a handful of sort of uh, technologies, techniques that are really uh, showing promise in the research and in you know, human lives in the U.S. and, of course, worldwide. And, the, and some of these are new and some are not. Some techniques are quite ancient. Meditation or mindfulness, as it's often called today, is a, a low-key version of meditation, is incredibly supportive of brain health and will do lots of things to promote executive function, meaning control of attention, uh, as well as less reactivity, as well as probably better uh, working memory. There's other accessible things that are newer and more tech-bound. Um, most of the cognitive training uh, systems out there, these sort of online gamification of cognitive testing and cognitive training, unfortunately, most of those don't actually, uh, the, the research suggests that those games, anything you, you gain in those games does not transfer out of the game environment. So it's unlikely spending money on an online brain-based training system will do anything for you if it's a game. However, there's one exception, and there's some both pro and, and anti evidence, but there's some in the research suggesting that the, these, uh, there's an online game, uh, it's available for your phone, for your computer called the dual N back, uh, D U A L the letter N and the word back. Um, and this loads up working memory and, and may actually, uh, improve it slightly. And working memory is sort of a bottleneck to performance in so many aspects of having a mind and using it. Um, essentially, it's the RAM in your in your brain. You know, like like the more of it you have, the more apps you can have open on your computer, your brain before things start to get bogged down and you lose information. The human range is seven plus or minus two, I believe, for most people, and it's been thought of as a static resource for people. And there's some evidence that training on the dual end back can actually improve it. And then if you uh, uh, get into sort of modifiable behaviors, and I think these are really useful things to think about as accessible, low-cost things you can do. Those would include meditation. Those include exercise, you know, keeping some BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, high in your brain uh, will happen higher if you exercise regularly. Uh, sleep uh, regulation is critical and key in attention management. In fact, sleep and attention may be linked in in some very significant ways that are not only about sort of, you know, being too tired to pay attention. There's something about sleep architecture regulation and attention regulation that appear to be linked.
And uh, other modifiable behaviors um, would include diet, you know, eating a, a low starch, low sugar, uh, high fat, probably no grain uh, diet or is all a pro, pro health, pro brain health and pro brain performance diet. Uh, and then you get into sort of, um, you know, the most uh, powerful and the most cutting edge, I would say, techniques and approaches. Um, and those would include nootropics uh, and smart drugs, as well as things like neurofeedback, where you can kind of go in and fine tune aspects of the brain to affect function pretty quickly. A few things. Uh, back to the meditation, and then I want to touch a, touch a little bit about the nootropics. Yeah. Have you seen research or, or studies where it shows a specific amount of time that is that is best? Like, is, is there a difference between 10 minutes of meditation a day versus an hour of meditation a day? Yeah, I have not seen any well-validated research on those kind of, you know, lump sum comparisons, um, only because the effects uh, from meditation um, appear to accrue long term. And so most researchers want to look at changes in brains of meditators compared to non-meditators on a scale of like thousands of hours of meditation. So they get people to meditating you know, seriously for 10 or 20 years. That being said, there's a lot of recent research that looks at how soon the changes start to accrue in the brain. And there's a lot of good research suggesting that um, a couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks in, changes are really uh, starting to, uh, to occur. And these studies are not using massive amounts of meditation. They're using like, you know, 15, 20 minute meditations done once or twice a day. So the fact that you can get some of the expected changes in meditative brains, there are long-term benefits. In fact, I think that there's some benefits. It's, it's, it's a practice that changes your regulatory uh, approaches to some things, how reactive you are, how um, much space there is between your thoughts. And that's sort of inhibitory tone, if you will. But also sustained attention tends to be, and cognitive fatigue tends to be affected. Those things sort of inverse with each other. So I would say 10 or 20 minutes a day is okay. Um, an hour a day is great too. Um, I'm not sure it matters uh, so much that how much you do each day versus doing it every day. Okay, okay, I like that. And with nootropics, what kind you know should we be looking for? And uh, is is this a safe route? You know, long term. Yeah. And there seems to be just a lot a lot of companies, a lot of brands coming out right now in the space. Oh, yeah. So. Oh yeah, it's a wild west. It's a wild west in terms of you know people making a business concern of it, but it's also a wild west in terms of what's out there. There's a lot of um, you know powerful sort of end users and, and and power users who will do things like dig up an old paper and have something synthesized, and then suddenly it's on the market. Um, so I think that uh, you got to be really cautious. And just because something is called a nootropic, you know this this new buzzword that we use uh, doesn't mean it is a nootropic. Um, I would argue that we need to consider the definition of nootropic as supporting cognition, and that usually means decreasing stress, improving attention and focus and memory. I think we need to consider that definition. The other half of the definition is it's neuroprotective and has few or no side effects. And that last part of it, you know, few or no side effects, that is not true of most of the things being touted as nootropics. It's not even true of coffee, you know, with its appetite suppressant, habit forming, all kinds of things. I'm very pro coffee, but don't call it a nootropic, you know. Don't call Adderall or Ritalin nootropics. They're cognitive enhancers, maybe. They're definitely smart drugs. That being said, it's hard for the, for the person who's entering this fray to understand what is and isn't a, a nootropic. I, I recommend that if people are interested in sort of you know, self-hacking with these compounds, the best and the, you know, a pretty good place to start that's really safe and really accessible and cheap without very many risks, or probably any risks, is just adding uh, some L-theanine to your coffee. L-theanine is an amino acid found in tea, and it produces this calm feeling, and I believe it releases um, GABA in the brain, which is sort of linked to alpha or calming, more, more sort of uh, reduction in, in firing rates and things. And alpha can also be useful in a flow state, sort of to get you in the, in the zone where you aren't stressed, but you're, you're sort of moving through tasks. When you combine uh, L-theanine with caffeine, it produces this really nice sort of smooth push. Tea uh, contains L-theanine uh, naturally, right? So that sort of smooth feeling you get from tea I, I, I am now convinced that the British conquered the world because of L-theanine, not because of uh, you know their culinary expertise or anything, you know, <laughs> or even really martial uh, expertise. I think it was L-theanine. I think they could sort of ramp up uh, with the black tea 
get all caffeinated and there was enough L-theanine in those tea leaves to keep them sort of uh, in a, nutri- in a, in a, in a, a super performant state. Um, so they, I, I, I really do feel that the British Empire was among the first you know, uh, nations of nootropic users uh, when they expanded and conquered the world. Um, so you can get L-theanine at most you know, drugstores and supermarkets and things. And just you know, take some with your coffee and see if you can spot the difference. And it especially becomes noticeable when you're on your second or third cup or you, know, you, might, have had it, you might have overdone it that day on caffeine. So I tend to keep a bottle of L-theanine around as a you know, sort of offset or buffer for, for when I overdo my, you know, single origin, small batch pour overs that I, you know, suck down like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> I'll have to check out, I'll have to go to the store and pick some uh, L-theanine up. But now you talked about some higher tech strategies like neurofeedback. What exactly does this do? And is this something that just the everyday person could go and and try out or yeah well the everyday person can certainly walk into a clinic or a lab or a you know uh, an office a training office and and get it done um it does require a little bit of skill it's not technically that challenging to paste a couple of electrodes to the scalp and measure brain activity and then in the training process the training session it's kind of like going to the gym for your brain uh the analogy is imperfect and i'll explain why in a second but um you you show up you sit down you have a couple of electrodes pasted to your scalp and then passively, this is not a zapping process, passively we measure your EEG. And you're making all brain waves all the time, things we call alpha, beta, delta, gamma, theta. And certain um, of these frequencies are tied to regulatory states. So for instance, if you're really ADHD or, you know, or really uh, sort of poorly inhibited, um, you make a lot of theta, a lot of theta across the frontal part of the brain, especially often. And so you measure theta from the middle part of the head, and as it's fluctuating moment to moment, whenever it trends in the proper direction, you know, theta drops, let's say, and beta rises, you make something happen on a computer screen. You, know, you, you make a Pac-Man eat some dots or a spaceship fly or make an audio track swell in volume. There's all kinds of different reward stimuli, you know, tactile stimuli, auditory stimuli, all kinds of things. It doesn't seem to matter you know, what reward, what feedback you provide to the brain. But when you set up this sort of loop of feedback being provided whenever the brain drifts uh, naturally in what you, you know, somewhat arbitrarily decide is the good direction or the right direction, this acts as, a, as operant conditioning or, or involuntary shaping of brain activity. And slowly, gradually, the brain starts to try to essentially make the input smooth or get control of the input. And by doing that, it changes the amount of brain waves you're making, the amplitude of these frequencies you're making in different ranges. And so you can tune like the theta beta ratio and often eliminate ADHD in 20 or 30 sessions of training or fix a sleep onset problem or train up blood flow in the frontal lobe instead of EEG to fix migraines. So you're sort of, you know, treating the brain as if it's you know, not just a, a, a blank mass behind your ears, but something like the body that needs to be, you know, adjusted sometimes and tuned up and exercised. And so when you come in for, for neurofeedback, we do a QEEG, a quantitative EEG, which sort of gets some baseline activity and shows how your brain might be different from the average brain in a whole bunch of different ways. And typically the most unusual uh, statistical patterns are often related to something you want to change, like some anxiety. You know, for instance, when you close your eyes, the back of your head, the, the visual and parietal cortex sort of in the back of the head pumps out um, a lot of alpha. It goes sort of neutral or idle into this resting state because the eyes are closed and there's no input into the visual cortex. When you open your eyes, it goes into beta because it's now processing that input. If you're anxious and you close your eyes, it stays in beta. It doesn't go idle, just in case, just in case the environment needs to be processed because it's, you know, you've learned on some levels, a regulatory level, that the universe or the world is, you know, threatening or dangerous or unpredictable in some fashion. And so now you scan the environment continually, even with, you know, out much input coming in your senses. So if somebody comes in and I map their brain and they complain of being a little keyed up and I see that their occipital cortex is staying super active with their eyes closed, I would ask them, oh, you know, I see that you're a little bit anxious or you're hypervigilant at least. Oh, yeah, I am. How'd you know? Well, it's right here. You know, and then I see, oh, I see some frontal theta. Oh, you're, you know, is, is there some um, impulsivity that you're trying to get rid of? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, 
And so we talk about the different patterns, and these are not uh, – I'm giving the impression maybe that they're, these are cut and dry. Um, they're, they're not exactly. They're not diagnostic. Um, they're more prognostic. Uh, the idea that there's patterns that are often problematic but not always. You know, Sometimes brains are just individual and unique, and that's fine. But you, you identify the patterns that are there that are someone's working with, and then – you show up and play video games, essentially, or you know, listen to audio tracks. And over several sessions, people come two, three, four times a week. Over several sessions, you know, your brain shifts, and so you figure you're talking about you know two to four months to eliminate ADHD, or a few weeks to get rid of sleep problems, or sometimes instantly to shut down migraines. And then you train the brain to be more resilient for a few more weeks to you know permanize that process. But unlike medications, unlike most nootropics, neurofeedback is a largely permanent process. You know, you're building new resources and new modes. And once the brain's in those modes, it's always practicing. So you don't have to sort of intentionally try to keep doing it. Um, you know, it's a form of biofeedback, but peripheral biofeedback where you're training the body, the heart, the skin response, the, all kinds of things. Those are uh, regulatory skills you have to learn. And then if you don't practice them, if you don't practice like breath pacing or heart rate variability, HRV, if you don't practice those things, you lose the skills. Central biofeedback or neurofeedback, uh, once you've produced changes, the changes are largely permanent because you're always sort of practicing them in, involuntarily, if you will. Well, it's, it sounds like you can you can use neurofeedback as a way to kind of get rid of a lot of these ailments, like like you said, migraines and, and and sleep problems by changing the way that the brain is working. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and you know you can also take. It doesn't have to be a deficit or a problem. Uh, I have folks that come in and they're sort of high powered executives, and they find that you know three o'clock, three thirty in the afternoon, they're getting kind of burnt out. And they want to just power through a few more hours or their sleep isn't ideal. It's okay, but, you know, it could be better. We all spend moments being super checked in, you know, resisting the impulse to look around and become distracted on off task. And then we all have moments where our attention is sort of suboptimal. And to some extent, the neurofeedback process can, you know, give you more control over your attention. So you can choose to sit in a focused versus a, you know, wide multitasking mode, for instance. I like that. And now let's move into something that I call the knowledge zone. I'm just going to ask you kind of some rapid fire questions here and then uh, we'll, we'll go to the conclusion. Okay. okay. Hey, I want to share with you more about the knowledge for men three day intensive retreat. I will show you how to discover yourself so you'll know exactly who you are, what you want and have the conviction on how to get there. You can become a leader so you can achieve greatness in all aspects of your life and become the man you want to be. It is all lying within us dormant until the right teacher helps us tap into our inner warrior. You will be tested, challenged, and pushed beyond your limits. And together, we will push the boundaries of what is really possible in your life. So go to kfmretreat.com to apply because there are only 10 spots for the retreat and there are thousands of people listening to this right now. When the 10 spots are gone, they're gone. So go to kfmretreat.com and join me now. This is your time. I'd love to serve you in building and creating a bigger life. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, two, one, showtime. The first question I have for you, uh, Andrew, is uh, what advice would you give to someone who's feeling kind of lost or unsure of their purpose? Well, you know, you probably already know what you want to do. Uh, I would say uh, I saw a, a quote on a mug, and I don't know who the quote's by, but it's, um, you know, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? You know, if you ask yourself that question, you probably have an answer. You, you know what you would do. Or if money didn't matter, you know, ask yourself those questions, regardless of the roadblocks, of, of anything in the way, any resources, logistics, you know, what would you do? And I'm sure you can come up with a few answers and, you know, come up with more than one and that'll help you not have to, you know, come up with the answer too. All right. I like that. And what was holding you back from the man you are now today? Um, ooh, that's a big question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would say perspective on what was possible is probably the only, you know, the, the best way to frame it succinctly. All right. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, I, you know, 10, 10 years ago, I was, or actually, let's say 13, 14 years ago, I was, uh, the idea of doing a PhD was, was kind of mind boggling. 
uh, the idea that I would spend five, six, seven years in school and, you know, take on all this uh, time and energy and effort to get a, an advanced degree was, was mind boggling. And yet I, I wasn't, of course, uh, terribly happy um, doing, doing what I'd been doing in the high tech. And so the idea that I, I could switch gears 180 degrees was, wasn't something I was fully sort of, you know, I hadn't internalized it. Intellectually, I knew that it was possible, but I didn't have the perspective on, yes, it's possible to stop being a high tech uh, dollar wonk and do a 180 degree turn. I hadn't taken a, an academic class in, you know, 10 plus years and go back into academia. You know, it, just, the, just the idea that, that really anything was possible that I decided to do wasn't a perspective that I was really believing. And I think it, you know, that's something that, that many of us could, uh, could benefit for putting more trust in, that anything is pretty much possible given you know, some, some effort. Absolutely, I like that. And can you name a person who's had a tremendous impact on your life, maybe a mentor? How has this person impacted your life? Yeah, um, there's a, there's a, a um, I mentioned him earlier, the, the gentleman that trained me to do neurofeedback um, he's a, a doctor in Providence, Rhode Island, named Larry Hirschberg uh, at the Neurodevelopment Center. And, um, you know, I had left high tech and I was foundering, wondering what to do next and went and got a job working for this for this uh, psychologist. And, you know, I, I had been in, in this really high powered uh, business world for several years. And, and uh, not only was he a you know, sweet, gentle psychologist, but he had some you know, real serious tech uh, ability and was was in this cutting edge area of neurofeedback. And um, had I not found him as somebody to work with uh, when I was looking around for alternatives to, you know, what I had been doing, I don't think I would have, uh, you know, ended up where I am today. Um, he just, I, I just saw so much was possible that I just n- would not have believed um, had somebody – like I, I describe what, what can happen in neurofeedback and people, you know – uh, look at me kind of funny because it's amazing what you can do to the brain. But I happened to, you know, get a part-time job with this guy and, and it was just the absolute perfect person to work with because he, you know, showed me what the brain could do uh, in some pretty, pretty profoundly challenged brains. So, Was there any uh, specific advice that he gave you that gave you some sort of aha moment? You know, there probably wasn't. Um, Larry Hirschberg uh, was tra- was trained initially in a sort of you know Freudian psychodynamic uh, you know that's not, not not Freudian but sort of psychoanalytic rather where you're you know you're mostly providing a blank slate and going uh huh uh huh right um, how does it make you feel and even as a as a mentor and as a boss he had that perspective so um, at the time when I when I started working for him I was actually profoundly hyperactive myself you know pretty unmanaged ADHD. And uh, he sort of took all that, you know, frenetic activity of mine, just kind of you know, pointed me in the right direction and got me working with kids and hardware and, um, you know, without saying much, just sort of let me make my own mistakes and find my own successes. So uh, I think it was the lack of advice. I would have maybe not taken advice from people at that point all that well, you know, being young and knowing everything already. <laughs> right. Uh, very common. And, you know, just, just kind of like, Probably tough for any anyone, uh, you know. But what are your three most influential books, and why? Yeah, um, I have to say, as a kid, I read uh, Heinlein's *Stranger in a Strange Land*, and you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little dated now. But uh, this idea that um, it was, it was probably my, my, my. I mean, I was like, I don't know, ten, twelve years old when I read it, and probably way too young for you know some of the content. But this idea that if humans were exposed to dramatically different sort of upbringings and, you know, weren't saddled with the trappings of nine to five jobs and, you know, the corporate world and like what else might matter. And, and Highland sort of painted a convincing picture of a, um, you know, not a religion, but sort of a spiritual, you know, appreciation of the world, sort of a reverence for the world. And I, I you know, that, that sort of stuck with me, uh, um, thankfully I, you know, I shed some of Highland's, you know, fifties sexism in his writing too, but, but I, but I kept some of his, you know, sense of childlike wonder from that book, especially, I think. Uh, and then, um, in, uh, you know, more recently, uh, there's a poet slash translator named Ladinsky who, um, translated a book of Hafiz. Hafiz was a, a Sufi mystic who wrote, uh, poetry, um, 
uh, sort of a, uh, I think he was among the, I think it may, it may have been the first whirling dervish to put it in, in perspective a few hundred years before Rumi. And um, Ladinsky translated a book of, uh, or translated some of Hafiz's work into a poem called The Gift. And I think it's just a wonderful, you know, just a, a wonderful place to go and, and uh, you know, get some nuance without being linear. Like I tend to, I tend to fall into a, you know, scientific analytic mode and, and uh, that's a nice, re nice refuge. And then a third book, um, geez, you know, uh, um, probably one of the first things that got me thinking about psychology uh, or the mind and the brain as a, as a career, or at least put, you know, put that seed in there, might have been uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Uh, I think it's Oliver Sacks, right? And that was talking about the strange things that go wrong when uh, I think right hemisphere uh, modules get sort of um, blown out. And, you know, now we know that the right hemisphere often has supervisory control over both sides of the brain or both sides of our environment. And so if, you know, lesion the back right on the uh, parietal temporal area, you lose awareness of the left side of space. You know, don't dress the left side of your body or eat the left side of your, the food in your plate. And Sachs had a whole host of these bizarre stories of specific things, you know, losing the ability to put faces together and so, you know, thinking that you're talking to your wife when you're talking to a hat, because that's what you've learned to identify your wife as, is the hat. And it's just sitting on the hat stand right now, and you're talking to it or something, you know. So uh, probably those are the three books that I would have to say, you know, across a pretty broad spectrum of uh, topics. All right. I like that. And I'll have to check out some of those books. And I got a scenario here for you, Andrew. Imagine, okay. <laughs> imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell them to do? And then also, what would you tell them not to do? Well, I, I would tell them to not waste time. He's just, uh, he's just, um, it's, it's more important to get, to get where he's going and less important to have fun doing it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I would say, you know, spend more time. I mean, I, I graduated from college in the uh, early 90s. So I'd say, you know, learn to become a computer programmer because that's one skill I've never acquired. And had I picked it up then, I think things would have been different in my career. So, so kind of like go after that, that skill that, uh, yeah. that, that's evolving yeah, and growing know, in the, in the exactly. tech industry. Exactly. Here's, here's a skill, you know, buy Apple, buy Microsoft, learn to computer program <laughs> and stop, you know, dicking around. Like everything else will come. The things you care about, the things you're worrying about right now, non-issue, you know, all the girls, they're going to like you, you know, all the money, it's going to come. It doesn't matter. You know, you're going to have successes and adventures. That's all going to come. All the things you're, that you're worried about, you're going to get them because that's life. What might not come are, you know, things that are goal driven where you pick like, like, you know, really narrow areas of interest, like cognitive neuroscience or, or <laughs> you know, you know spe like, like specific, specific careers. I've had a whole bunch of careers and I don't regret any of them at all, but you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I was a decade older than my contemporaries in my grad program, which isn't a big deal, but I could have been making, you know, strides in the neurofeedback and nootropics world you know, 10 or 15 years ago, which might've been fun when nootropics especially were brand new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So just kind of winding down here, would you, would you like to, could you share like your, just kind of looking back at what you've done in your career and, and, uh, where you are now, it's like, what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? Um, you know, I think it's really, uh, closely aligned with what I said at the very beginning for advice is that, um, yeah, yeah. if you do what you love, everything else comes and, if you start early enough in doing what you love, then you don't build, you know, responsibilities or limits into your life that get in the way of that. You know, you just like go for what you want uh, as soon as you as soon as you think you might want it. It's okay if on the way there you decide that you don't want it. I mean, you can change your horse as many times as you want, regardless of if you're in a stream or not. You know, just just doesn't matter. Feel free to be flexible and change. And I've you know certainly done a lot of that. But but go for it, you know, like really pursue what you think you might want. Yeah, I think that kind of just came full circle there. And now just kind of concluding out of the knowledge round, just like what's exciting you today? Like what's really getting you out of bed in the morning? Yeah, so, you know, I spent a lot of my time working in the clinic doing biofeedback and neurofeedback. And then, uh, you know, a couple times a week I'm over working with True Brain in Santa Monica um, you know, designing new products and research and thinking about ways to, that we can, you know, push that space. But, uh, what's really exciting me is the convergence, the accessibility of brain tech 
you know, there's, there's a new field, a uh, new-ish field now, probably, you know, 10, 15 years old, called BCI, Brain Computer Interface. This is like, you know, writing letters on your computer with a with an EEG headset, not with a mouse, for instance, because it's up when you see the word you want or something. Um, and so BCI is the brain changing, or the brain changes controlling the computer, you know, the brain controlling the environment, let's say. And neurofeedback is actually the other way around. It's the computer changes to shape brain activity, change the brain. So um, what's really exciting me is the sort of uh, impending crash of all this high-end tech from many different places. You know, the BCI world is pumping tons of money into really elegant and amazing uh, stuff. And the neurofeedback world is a little bit hidebound, been around for 60 years, and it's still a bit niche because it's largely clinical. You know, it's largely solving people's problems, not, you know, pushing big business strategies. And um, the fact that these two fields are colliding now because they use the same link, the same loop with the computer and the brain, just run in the opposite directions. Um, I think we're going to be... I think we're going to be amazed at the ability of us controlling our environment, also controlling ourselves by controlling our environment, if you will, by shaping our brain activity. Um, these will all become, you know, our house will put us in a better mood when it notices we're not in a good mood. Like we'll have reactive, adaptive environments probably within the next decade or so. So that's, that's very much exciting me in terms of how these two fields, BCI and neurofeedback are colliding and about to sort of change each other. Mm, really exciting stuff there. And go ahead and give yourself a plug on how my audience can follow up with you moving forward. Sure. So um, if you want to follow my Twitter, Andrew Hill, PhD, nice and easy. Um, and uh, True Brain, T R U Brain.com is our nootropic uh, line. We have a, a neutral capsules and now the Think Drinks, which are uh, sort of the first active nootropic drink on the market. And um, of course, uh, if folks want some personal work or want to learn more about neurofeedback uh, and EEG brain mapping, uh, alternativesbraininstitute.com is the uh, website for our lab and clinic. Um, I'm actually looking right here at True Brain, and uh, yeah, can, can, <laughs> I like the, the image you have here, like tea, coffee, energy, and then True Brain. I like that. And then think drinks. That's right. The evolution of energy. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. So how how does this uh, how does this work? So uh, because um, some of the nootropics in True Brain work better day in day out, or at least several times a week, we encourage people to sign up for a regimen. I think you can do a one off now, but uh, normally it's uh, you know you you pay a certain amount per month or per quarter or every six months or something, and we ship a box to you. And the box is either morning and afternoon packets of capsules for your week for your weekdays. Um, plus a few boost or turbo capsules for extra days, or uh, it's I think I think now it's thirty drinks. There's a couple of different configurations, um, and the drinks are either caffeinated or not. And we have some uh, uh, the, the 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 drinks are new and we're about to change the flavor slightly. They're they're not horrible now actually. They're 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 pretty good on the energy sort of drink spectrum, um, but we're about to make them even better and. Uh, um, but yeah, they're essentially a regimen um, style. So most of our users get a box delivered at the beginning or end of the month and, you know, use it uh, a couple times a day. All right. I like that. I'll, I'll be sure to, uh, I'll leave a, a website link inside the blog post that I create for you. But Andrew, uh, it's, it's been, it's been great having you on the show and just kind of exploring these different areas of the brain and, uh, nootropics and smart drugs. And, uh, it's, it's a little bit different, but I think it's, it's still really effective and much needed uh, for a lot of guys to hear. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, happy to be here, Andrew. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge From In podcast. Hundreds of interviews and a million downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement, and we've just started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a review in iTunes. It really helps to grow the podcast. Guys, 2015 is the official year of living with purpose, where every day you do only the things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. Check out kfmfree.com to get free tools I've created to help you crush life. Again, that's kfmfree.com. This is your host, Andrew Fairby, and I'll see you in the next episode.